for those of you that may be interested, uh, we've got a little merchandise alert. So we finished up the oak planking a little while ago, and that means we've got a bunch of oak planking offcuts. So some are bigger than this, some are smaller than this, uh, but we saved all of the ends. So when we made the planks, we made them long and we cut them all back, and we saved all of those from the oak planks. So we've got chunks of acorn to Arabella's oak planking. We also have the frame ends from when we cleaned up the uh, port side. All of those got cut down. So we've got a whole bunch of frame ends. Also, some are longer, some are shorter. And we've got some rivets. This one is a pristine rivet, um, but every once in a while, some of the heads don't form quite big enough. So we've got a few with undersized heads that we don't want to put into the boat. And we've got even more that when they went to get put in, they bent over, they got hit a little funnily, uh, and we had to pull them out. So most of the rivets are, are kind of bent because we went to install them and something happened every 50th rivet or so, it seems like. Uh, so we've got a bunch of those, and we also finally got around to putting up the challenge coins. So Doug from SV Seeker a while back got challenge coins made for all of the different YouTube boat building channels. Uh, and we have a hundred challenge coins remaining. Uh, so we finally got those up as well. So if you go to <clears throat> our website and to the merchandise page, you will find all of these recent additions. And last time we put up um, ends of the frames and the rivets, they went really, really fast. Uh, so we expect that to happen again. There's not terribly many of them. And it's uh, first come, first serve. So get after it. Uh, all right, and so that's, that's the only real quick announcement that we had. Just wanted to give you a heads up about that stuff. And without further ado, here's a normal video. Thanks for following and supporting and helping to make these, uh, these weekly videos possible. We couldn't be doing it without the support. So thank you and look forward to seeing you here every Friday. In this video, Carolyn returns and takes a walk through the interior that Steve mocked up. And then she breaks out the oakum and the caulking tools and she and Steve pitch the bilge. Also, Steve's friend Satchel came by to take a look at the interior, but rather than cut it down and just give you all bits and pieces of it, we decided to leave it relatively uncut and as a separate bonus video today. You'll get to see Steve's current floor plan and how and why that diverges a bit from Atkins' classic layout. It's a great conversation and a very good look at what will be the next big steps for Arabella. So after talking with Satchel, I think I'm pretty happy with the interior, uh, kind of how we have it mocked up here. Carolyn's supposed to show up tomorrow morning, uh, so I think I'm gonna leave all of this mocked up and then I can get her opinion on it as well and then we can make some marks and take some notes about where bulkheads are gonna be. And then as soon as we're done pitching the build, we won't have to reconstruct any of this. We can just get right to work, doing the final fit on the forward bulkhead there and getting the, uh, the doorway built and getting the bulkhead and the wood stove and, and all that jazz done. Uh, so I think I'm gonna leave this. I'm gonna grab the truck, go down to the wood yard and go grab the maple that's down there because we're gonna be getting to interior work soon and I wanna have that maple on hand. So we'll get that brought up here. Uh, and then I think I'm gonna play in the four peak a little bit and do kind of some mock up up there. And today's gonna be a little bit of a, just setting the stage for tomorrow. I pulled out the stuff to do the, the rough caulking job that we have to do on the lower planks and what I think we'll need to pitch the build, but Carolyn can guide us a little more on that tomorrow. Uh, and then when she gets here, we can talk about this and check it out, pull all this stuff out of here, do a good clean and get to pitching the bilge and throw a couple more coats of paint on here. Be nice to paint this stuff without the rest of the interior in the way. So we'll give that another day to finish hardening up. It's, it's just about there, condense it a little bit. It's amazing in this humidity, how long it takes to dry. Uh, yeah, cool. I'm gonna go grab the chalk and go get some maple. The wood yard here is pretty much cleaned out. I mean, we've got a lot of pine in here, uh, which is great. It's been air dried, some of it for, I think this stuff down here, um, for like three years. And the stuff over there has been drying for I think five now. 
So when it comes time to do the deck, this will be perfectly plenty, incredibly dry, which will be fantastic. And what I'm after today is this row right down here. And that is all sugar maple. And I think we're gonna use that in the interior. So I'm gonna slide that out of there. And pile it all into the bed of the truck and take it up and stack it in the boathouse. Hello, Carolyn. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Some of my stuff. You got all sorts of new stuff going on. Yeah, the uh, the interior is actually pretty much mocked up. That's pretty cool. I mean, a good chunk of it. You want to go take a look? I would love to. Right. That would be really cool. Wow, there's a partition. There's a bulkhead. Yeah, first bulkhead's been been working on putting that in. Yeah. Well, kind of like two, one and a half bulkheads. So you've got a four peak and you've got a forward compartment. Yeah, that mahogany panel there, that is pretty much exactly where it was in Victoria, except for one frame farther forward. It was right up against the Samson post. Oh, very cool. Actually under the Samson post. Victoria's Samson post did not pierce the deck. Well, it's not really a Samson post, is it? I, I don't know. I mean, that's what they tied off to. And it was a 4x4 four four that went through the deck and was attached to the deck beams, but went no farther down than the deck beams. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see, but there's a string here. Oh, and that's, that's your... marking out the bunk. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be a really comfortable space. The pink is easy to see. It's good. It's pink string. Pink string, yeah. Pink string. Sweet. So this is no longer plywood. It's actually a real house top now. Yeah. That's yep. crazy. Yeah, it's all strip built out of the cedar, nailed and drilled. Nailed and drilled. Between looking at like old varnished mahogany with bronze fittings and like a shipmate stove. It's just automatically now a boat. It's just just is. I feel, I feel like every semi-significant significant step, people are like, now it finally looks like a boat. <laughs> now it finally looks like a boat. And on launch day, people are going to be like, now, now it finally really looks like a boat. Now it like a boat. That's true. You should probably put like a hashtag for every time that that has been said in like a video. <laughs> oh, now, now she looks like a boat. But yeah, I just feel like for all the boats that I've ever been in, like the drop leaf table, the frame and panel siding, and like the cast iron shipmate stove. It's like the quintessential feel for like all the boats that I have personally ever been on. And it, it feels really cool to see it in here. This is a good height. Cause I guess like your sole is going to be just a little bit thinner, like another half inch down or something. Yeah. And maybe not even, but maybe not even. So this is a really nice with the house top. It's like the perfect height for inside. This thing is still so cool. Like just, you can, you have different sizes you can take out. Like, wow, wow. And you got this in here by yourself? Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I was here by myself and I really wanted to see it in the boat, so. I took everything off that I could. Mm -hmm. So the front doors and the plates off the top and the legs. And then, yeah, I carried it out here and then very carefully carried it down the companionway and put it where it is now and then put the doors and the top back on it. So it looks like this is gonna be like a berth area. Yep. A little bunk. And this is, I'm assuming, kind of where this is gonna be. Yeah, more or less. Okay. And just like build out behind it, which will be nice. 
Get a look at your thing here. Ooh. So you got the shipmate stove, the like tea kettle stove, right? Yep. And then according to your diagram, looks like you're going to have a real stove, but like a different stove here. Yep, that's the galley stove. That's a nice, like, right here, all the actions right here. All your hot stuff stays in one place. That's the idea. You got hot and pre-made hot plate. If you need to put no trivets necessary. Um, so that I guess right here is kind of like the galley area, right? Yeah, precisely. Nice. Sweet. So this is like a good, like you could be one person and access everything. This is a really nice size space. So and then just my question for the companionway entrance. Um, this is going to be that nice sill for water stop and then are you going to have just like a small sliding hatch up here yeah so there will be a sliding hatch where you will have to figure out exactly i think the companionway ladder will get built mm -hmm. and then once that's finalized we'll figure out exactly where that hatch wants to be so that we can keep it as small as possible but also have it be functional so you're not hitting your shoulders or anything on it sure. when you're coming up and down yeah well this like you only have to use one weatherboard then yeah that's kind that's of the nice. idea yeah yeah and then we'll probably end up putting some sort of bimini dodger thing going on. Um, and with having that little higher bit there at the bridge deck, splashing water and any water, you know, that's on deck is less likely to find its way in. Sure. Sure, sure. But yeah, no, she looks really, really nice down below. This is going to be a really fun next, next phase of the project, just like starting to realize the interior space. Yeah, that's actually, I think, the next thing on the docket. So I'm probably going to have you help me, and we'll take everything that's in the boat out of the boat. Sure. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. Psyched. Now that I'm back, the next step that we're working on is pouring pitch into the really inaccessible places in the bilge that otherwise would just trap dirt and debris. So pouring pitch in there is great. It's water resistant. It fills the space. It's really good for the wood. It's, you know, it's antifungal. It's a great thing to do. Um, so what we have now is we have a boat that hasn't been caulked. So we still have open seams in some places that will eventually swell up. So to keep the pitch in the boat when it's liquid, because it heats up, turns into a really runny liquid, uh, we're going to throw some oakum in those seams just for temporarily um, until the pitch is poured. And then we're going to reef that oakum back out. Um, so we're using the oakum because we have it, and um, cotton, which is what we're going to eventually really caulk the boat with, is much more expensive, and it will be harder to reef out of the pitch. Um, so we're starting with just throwing some oakum in these seams. It does two things. It, again, stops the pitch from running back out. It's also like a good practice for Steve and the gang to play with some caulking tools, and, you know, it's an easy way to practice. Um, so, yeah, we're working with oakum for our ca temporary caulking. Uh, and it's a hemp fiber. It comes in this um, kind of fibrous, thick strand sort of thing. And um, you, you just wouldn't want to work with this. It's too rough. It's too thick. It's too... Um, for all that it's thick, it's not really a single fiber. It's not uniform. So we want to turn it into something much more uniform. Um, which is this. This strand is a lot nicer to work with. You can see it's kind of pulling apart. It's not too stiff. Um, you can open it up so it's a lot wider or you can twist it so it's a lot narrower. And this is a nice thread of spun oakum, we call this spinning, um, that you can actually end up caulking with. Um, so we will spin this bale of oakum that we've gotten here and we'll turn it into these skeins of spun oakum um, and from here, we can actually take it down and set it up in a bucket to have it spool out for us while we caulk. These are two different bales. Um, this bale came essentially twice as wide as this bale came. So you can do two things. You can directly spin this oakum, which I'll show you in a second, or you could have split this into two pieces, which I think is what happened to this one. I think this is a split skein and this is a full skein. The actual spinning, this stuff's already pretty thin. What you're doing, uh, for all the textile workers out there, this is exactly like spinning wool. Um, you are separating the fibers. So each of these hemp fibers is of a different length, and they are intermixed with each other. That's just all rough and like this. So you're gently pulling it apart. You can use your knees. You kind of like hold with your hands and let your legs do the work. 
And then you're spinning it together. And so you're, you're pulling those fibers into parallel with each other. And kind of if there's a big knot of them in one place, you're teasing them apart gently, gently, so they all lay. And then you're spinning them into a yarn. You're just kind of giving them a direction to remember. Um, you don't need to make it this beautiful piece of yarn or single ply string. You just want to give it a uniform overall lay. Um, but even still, we want to get this nice thread to work with because we don't want to mar our seams. We want to put this in there nice and proper. And then when we reef it out, we want it to come out nicely. Again, that spin will let it come out much more uniformly. Um, so the, the hemp itself, it's, it's got a really distinct smell. It's impregnated with pine tar. Um, so this stuff's actually pretty dry. It's kind of itchy, but new, a new bale is really oily. It's both the hemp oil and the tar that's in it. Um, so your pants get really waterproof and your hands get really soft. Uh, and if you like the smell of, of pine tar and hemp oil, then you're set. If you don't, then you're going to smell pretty, pretty interestingly for a bit. Um, but yeah, this is the same fiber that all uh, lines and rope used to be made from. And in fact, it used to be a gunning fiber. So when uh, old, old style cannons were used with black powder and charges, uh, it would be wads of this that would be packed in the charge to create the compression for the, for the explosion to take place. Um, so oakum and hemp fiber is actually a pretty, pretty long-standing traditional fiber for the maritime world, at least the European maritime world. I'd imagine this is an activity you can do at the end of the day with a beer pretty easily. Absolutely. Or it's great if you have like a bunch of apprentices, you're like, go roll oakum. Just, I don't, I have to do other things. Go roll oakum. Oh man, it's the most frustrating though when you're working on it and it's just like pulling apart and you're just getting like these four foot sections. You're like, I hate everything. It just takes practice. So yeah, then you just loosely coil it up. You got this nice workable yarn and then you just kind of really gently twist it, and then I just tuck a little bite in there so that it stores nicely because you can roll this a week ahead of time and store it and then you just start working with it. There we go. So basically the spaces that we're talking about pitching all along this keel are just these void spaces here um, between the keel timber, the backbone timber, and the planking where, I mean, you can see it's just it's just a good spot to accumulate, accumulate stuff. Um, so we're not filling this whole well, we're just pouring a little bit in the sides. Um, so we're gonna start uh, probably in this bay uh, between this frame and this strapping. Cause you can see up forward of this, the sawn frames are actually, they just come through. You, you don't have to worry about it, stuff can flush through. So this will be the first pocket that really starts to accumulate. Um, so, just kind of looking, what I'm looking for is the seam, the plank, where that starts, because that will tell me where to start caulking on the outside for our plan of just putting something in there so the pitch doesn't flow out. So, just chasing this, okay, keeping the same plank. Uh, I'm going to where I can get a countdown to the actual garboard seam, because um, when we go outside of the boat, I need a visual reference, and for me, it's just counting up from the garboard plank. So I start to see the garber down there. So I'm going to start counting one, two, three, four, five, six. So I want to start caulking on the seam above the sixth plank from the garber. So this is our seam that we want. So I've just marked it out in chalk to let me know where to start caulking on the exterior of the hull. Because again, right now we're not putting this in for forever. We just want to do as little work as we have to so that we have to take out as little work as we have to. Um, because again, you wouldn't start with oakum. Um, we're just putting oakum in to keep the pitch from pouring out. There are several things you wouldn't do what, what we're doing right now, uh, which is start with oakum. You wanna start with cotton uh, because it compresses much more tightly than oakum does. So it really gets in there back there and fills the space. 
Um, and you wouldn't ever start on the rabbit. Um, the rabbit should be the last seam to be cocked on the boat because uh, it has the most backing. It has the backing of the keel timber. You're not going to move this. You're going to move all of these guys against each other. So you want to move all of those and then lock it in with the rabbit. This is a threading iron. This is the first thing that you use. Uh, it is really thin. I actually ground this down. Uh, basically, you want this as thin as you can get before it starts cutting your caulking. Um, so it's a really fine entrance and it's a really smooth uh, taper. And this is the thing you use for just putting whatever cotton or oakum you're using into the seam, making it stay. Um, and then you can also start to set it in with this. You can give it a nice set to kind of roll it into the seam, which will make more sense when we see it. Um, but then you have different irons to actually like hammer it home or make it home. Um, so you can see a really interesting variety here. We've got just like a smooth iron that's pretty narrow, so this would probably be some of the, a lot of the seams that we do on this boat. And then you've got one with a single groove, and then you've got one with two grooves. Um, and that just helps because essentially what you're doing is you're rolling the oakum or cotton in on itself by the way that you're hitting it with the tools. Um, so those grooves just kind of help it fold up into itself. Um, you got some other funky ones. This is a nib iron. So if we were doing um, places where our other caulking irons won't fit, uh, we've got the nib iron. I've got a bent iron here. There's all sorts of things. If you need a specific tool, basically the caulkers are like, just go make it. Uh, your caulking mallet, the mythical magical caulking mallet. Uh, my personal take on it, and this is just my personal experience and opinion. Um, the shape is because when you're working, you just build up a rhythm, and then the wood is a lever on a fulcrum, and it creates a rhythm and balance, and the mallet does most of the work. You can caulk with whatever you want, whatever's comfortable for you. I like this. I also personally believe that the slots are just a shock absorber, and they help dissipate some of the vibrations that come out of hitting a piece of metal with a piece of wood. Um, this sinks in water. It's very dense wood. Uh, so I did a test piece just to see what it was going to feel like, and because I'm camera shy. Um, so I'll show you what I did, but I just started, put it in, threaded it in. So I threaded it first, and then I kind of set it in with a wider iron. Um, you'll see I start with the narrow threading iron to really get it back deep in the seam. Um, and then I come back with a wider setting iron to kind of roll the fuzzies in and tuck them in. So that'll make sense when it comes back to it. Um, but so two things to note if you look nice and close here. Uh, here, towards the front of the hood end, um, you can see that the oakum goes pretty deep, so I'm pretty confident that it went all the way into the seam, and it's going to pre create that block for the pitch that we want to see. Um, back here, it's pretty shallow, so I'm not confident that we're actually filling all of that space. So I'll probably set it in a little bit deeper. And uh, so some tips as you go through, you always want your iron, you always want to be caulking at 90 degrees to the seam, which on the rabbit's pretty nice to see. But if you look along the boat, you can see she takes a lot of twist and swell. So some people I know will put an iron ahead of them just as a visual, because it's really easy to start putting the stuff in at an angle. Um, and with softer woods like cedars or pines um, and narrower seams, it's really easy. You'll see when I first put it in, it's kind of puffy, so you don't really see the seam. And it's really easy to start caulking and then have your iron kind of start wandering out. And before you know it, you're caulking the grain line next to the seam, which is a pain because uh, then you have to go fix it. Um, so, yeah, it's just... Uh, I am still learning. I've been caulking for like three years now, so I'm still pretty slow because I am not a caulker. I'm a shipwright. I do caulking. Um, but there's nothing wrong with going slow and doing it right, just like anything else. It's weird because I know that we're just putting in and take it out. We want it all the way back there, but I'm so used to filling up. That's why you saw me putting some more in and some less in as I went because I could feel the seam get wider or deeper. So I really wanted to fill it, but then I was like, no, we're, we're at, we want to fill it, but we don't have to pack it in so it's watertight. 
Um, and you saw that I am pretty gentle still right here with this nib. Um, these are, this one's really extreme. This is going to be the trickiest spot to caulk for us because that's a lot of force going and packing in that seam around this nib. Um, and it's pretty easy to shatter that off. It's pretty easy to break that off. So I'm just going to go back in later, uh, make sure that it's packed in, that I am not going to wail on that spot with the mallet because again, we are going to pull this stuff back out uh, and I really don't want to crack that nib off before we deal with it. Steve, did you get mail? We did get mail. That's pretty exciting. So let's see. We got these from the lovely Med Chandler of Ships Koi Forge. So thank you, Med. Oh, we got stickers, Steve. We got stickers. What do you say? says, I hope we can catch up sooner than later. Cheers, Med. Nice. What do people think it's going to be? Why are we unwrapping it now? Those are some real big caulking irons. <laughs> no. We got reefing hooks. Which is really exciting. Oh, these look great, Med. Thank you. So reefing for y'all is the opposite of caulking. It's taking the stuff out of the seams, which we're going to need to do. because Both because we're intending to take the oakum out and because we kind of messed up. Talk about that soon. Um, but these are beautiful. Nice classic shape. Nice weight. Yeah. Can you draw us a large caulking seam? Oh, well, they sure can. Just a big picture of a caulking seam. Water. H2O. Yeah, so when you traditionally caulk, you want that caulking to kind of get stacked up in here so that when the plank swells, that end closes up. Yeah. But that's not what we want to do right now because right. what we're looking to do is put in pitch back here. And if the pitch gets into the caulking seam, that won't swell shut and we are in trouble. That's bad. That's bad. So what we actually want to do is get the caulking until we're seeing it on the inside of the hull. I'm going to fill that all in, which is not what you normally do. That would actually be a fairly bad. poor caulking job, but we're not actually caulking. Right. And I think what's going to help us really well, I forgot um, part of my toolkit are these linoleum knives work really great for reefing hooks because oh, they're so nice and thin. They're so thin. Um, and this is another thing we can, you know, put it in the seam to make sure we're actually going as deep as we need to go. Yeah. But I think between this um, and the sterrets and then just putting it in nice and gentle. I have to go get one more thing because the cardinal, you know, the cardinal rule of reefing hooks. Never use a steel hammer on a reefing hook because you don't want to mushroom over. This has a really nice profile um, so that when it goes in the seam, it doesn't widen the seam. Yeah. Um, so if you imagine you're hitting it with a steel hammer, you're gonna mushroom this over, and then you're gonna end up cutting your seam when you go to reef. That's how a lot of seams get big in old, like in the old schooners that I've worked in. Just cause you know, you hand somebody a reefing hook and go take it out, yeah. they don't know. Um, so I have a really nice dead blow that I use with mine or people use copper mallets or something like that. It's starting at five. I'm going to start tapping in. Okay. All right, I'm in six. You're starting on six? Yeah, I'm like halfway through six. Okay, yeah, I'm in, then I'm starting in six. Okay. Seeing anything? Yeah. A little more than that, more forward. Good. And then uh, do two inches forward of that. No, okay, good, good. Okay. 
So what we're working with here is a bucket of Jeffrey's Marine Glue number two, which is a combo of bitumen and rosin. Um, two things that kind of, one comes out of the ground near oil seeps and the other one comes out of trees. So both pretty sticky substances and combined together, they make kind of a sticky solid thing. Yeah, I was watching Carolyn beat away at this and we tried a bigger chisel with a sledgehammer to see if uh, bigger and harder and would work, but it just kind of got stuck in there. And then I had the brainchild that maybe the vibrations from the uh, air hammer would do it and it seems to be doing it. Yeah, so it's kind of like hammer a little bit, pull a little bit out, hammer a little bit, pull a little bit out. Um, what's that? What that's doing is both removing the old stuff, but also giving the, the bit a minute to cool down because it's really getting heated up and sticking stuff to it. So it's a good old dance. So yesterday, Carolyn and I spent like 10 or 11 hours and we pitched the entire bilge. It was a long, hot, stinky day. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, we had, um, we had some wells up forward that were easy to get to and those went really well. We did those first. Uh, but getting back here, uh, we had to actually move the diesel to get to the wells underneath the engine. Those are pretty critical to pitch. Um, the idea being that once the engine's back in place, we won't be able to get to them so putting those, uh, filling those wells with pitch had to be done. Um, so Steve MacGyvered this really interesting large hauling pipe thing. So that was, we were able to get back to where we needed to be. Um, and it's really good we did that because uh, as the pitch moves and flows, it's pretty hot. So um, it's not quite as viscous as, or it's not quite as thin as water. It's kind of like hot honey but it will find pathways that you didn't know existed. So we started to pour at one of the bays that's aft of the engine, and we realized pretty quickly that there's a pathway that goes all the way forward to right under the engine. Um, so that made a big mess trying to dam those different bays to try and fill them up and then fill the one aft of it up. Um, so we made a bit of a mess. Yeah, so back here you can kind of see the wells that we were working on. Um, these ones went really well. Uh, they weren't connected to anything else, so just the little dribble out, the little waterfalls there were great. It was when we went to start pouring these bay wells that it just ran all the way forward. Um, so between trying to fill those up to the point where we could then fill this one up and then fill this one up and then fill this one up, I mean, that's a great theory. But it turned out not to work in practice just because of the height differences of the different entry points and then the leveling points. So you can see we just got pitch everywhere. 
Um, but thankfully, it's pretty easy to clean up, and uh, several th factors affect that. Um, but like you can see, it's just kind of clipping right off of the metal here. And then it comes right off. Yeah. Yeah, it was very handy having your guidance. Just <laughs> practice. It's yeah, just, there's like, a few, few tips and things, and but yeah. for the most part, it's fairly simple. I think the, the temperature was the one that was the most, like getting it to where it melted evenly yeah. and you got it hot enough to pour, but no hotter than you absolutely had to get it. Absolutely. And like walking that line was, I think that was probably the, uh, seemed to be one of the, <clears throat> one of the trickier parts. Yeah, it takes a lot more managing than you want it to. Um, so we had those chunks that we were chunking out and we would always retain a little bit of liquid in the pitch pot as we were cooling or as we were heating it up and pouring it off into then the kettle that we would bring down here to pour into the wells. Um, so the pitch pot itself always had some liquid in it because it melted the solids faster. But it was really key to, to maintain that constant temperature by stirring it, just like keeping keeping some motion in the pot so that the chunks didn't just sit and then occasionally taking it off the fire when the liquid was getting really hot so the liquid would start to bubble and smoke and then stirring it and stirring it and stirring it and to try and break down those, those cold clumps and so you reduce the overall temperature and increase the consistency of it. So yeah, it takes like a lot of oversight and management um, but you end up with this really nice pour product um, and the nice thing about the way we were doing it is that with the two of us in the air hammer, we were always able to have material on hand. We didn't have to pause. We went through 62 pounds of 62 pitch. 62 pounds of pitch. You know, we lost a little bit in pots and spills and stuff, but there's, there's easily 55 pounds of pitch in the bilge. Most of it went in. Absolutely. Yeah, cleanup of the bilge is now going to be infinitely easier. So much less vacuuming. Yeah, there's no more little nooks and crannies anymore. Just a nice big open bottom. Yeah. And the peace of mind that comes with it. Did anyone see the bird nesting in the toolbox in this shot from last week? This is her fourth year in a row nesting somewhere in the boathouse. Next week, Carolyn and Steve press on with the bulkheads, and Steve will cut and install some mahogany trim pieces for the door to the Four Peak. Thanks as always for watching and all the support, and we look forward to seeing you all here next Friday.